for the MA in English and African American Literature here at North Carolina A&T State University. Welcome. We first of all apologize for the technical difficulties that we've had, as I like to call them, another hashtag <laughs> COVID, COVID dilemma, hashtag COVID trials. But nonetheless, thank you for your perseverance and for overcoming and deciding that what our featured speaker today has to say is important enough that you were gonna remain diligent. Thank you for joining us tonight as we convene our inaugural, I'm proud to say that our inaugural NCAT MA in English and African American Literature Alumni Lecture Series sponsored by the English Department here at ANT. The program will proceed in the following manner. First, we'll have the introduction of our speaker by English faculty, Dr. Joanna Little. Then we'll have our, speaker, our featured speaker, Dr. Dennis Winston. That will be followed after his speech that will be followed by a Q&A portion. We're asking that everyone in attendance, please put all of your questions in the Q&A, which is located at the center at the bottom of your screen. Both this as well as the chat will be monitored throughout the event. And finally, afterwards, closing remarks will follow. We look forward to what Dr. Winston has to share with us, as well as a thought-provoking discourse. Thank you again for supporting our efforts. Dr. Little. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Little. I am the chair of the African American Literature Program here at ANT State University in our English department. And I'm also a faculty member here. And I am also a very good friend of our guest tonight. I am super honored to introduce him. Dr. Winston and I, we journeyed through our MA program together. We took the same courses. We uh, were um, tutors in the University Writing Center together. We even interned um, briefly at the African American, or excuse me, the African Art Museum um, in the Dudley Building here at ANT, and we had lots of laughs there. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. We were even Mr. and Mrs. English Department. I don't know <laughs> if uh, Dr. Winston remembers that I uh, during homecoming. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time together. We had a lot of laughs and we shared a lot. Um, one thing I will say is that it was during our time together that I really learned the value in the art of argument because, and Dr. Jackson can attest to this, we were always debating about something. And I mean, it would be hours that we would go on these long debates about whatever was on our minds at the time or whatever we studied or whatever we were reading. So. I really valued our relationship. Uh, we learned how to engage in argument correctly. We learned how to find our own voice during that time. And I'll never forget those moments with Dr. Winston. Um, Dr. Winston is a writer, a scholar of African-American literature. He has taught courses in creative writing, popular black literature and hip hop studies. His poetry appears in Callaloo, and his research is featured in Street Lit, Representing the Urban Landscape, published by the Scarecrow Press in 2014. Dr. Winston also works with independent hip hop artists and producers in the Washington DC area for his live performance series called Hip Hop is Lit. He is a senior lecturer of English at the University of Maryland and the current editor in chief of Words Beat and Life, the Global journal, journal of Hip Hop Culture. I am pleased and honored to introduce to you all Dr. Dennis Winston. Thank you so much, Joanna and Hope, um, for hosting this. Um, I am truly honored to have been selected as the first speaker for this alumni series. Um, a and is my home, and the English department is where I learn that to be a teacher and scholar of African-American literature is to be an activist, to always be on a mission to center our voices and our experiences. And when I first started my studies as an undergraduate at North Carolina a and I actually thought I'd be a radio disc jockey. Um, for those um, who don't know, a little known fact, I was kind of a predecessor to Terrence J at one of 
for two jams. And I can assure you, Terrence has no idea who I am. Um, but I was one of the youngest on-air personalities at the, sta at the station in the 1990s until I was unceremoniously let go for oversleeping one too many times. Um, you can't oversleep when you work in radio, especially if you're on the morning show. Um, shortly thereafter, I began to hear Terrence's voice on the air at 102, and I distinctly remember thinking to myself, who is this guy taking my spot? So admittedly, I hated on him just a little bit, um, but that is until I started watching him on 106 in Park, which was when I realized that this brother has something that I don't talent. Um, but by that point, I was deep into my own purpose as a teacher and scholar of African-American literature. In 2002, I enrolled at ANT's, in ANT's master's program in English and African-American literature. And while I majored in English as an undergraduate, it was my time in graduate school at ANT that accounts for one of the most enriching academic experiences of my life. My classmates, Hope Jackson, Joanna Little, Michael Lindsay, Nicole Keith, Robert Randolph, Leonard Moore, and a whole bunch of others helped create an environment of academic rigor and achievement that stayed with me all the way through my doctoral studies at Texas A&M. But it was at A&T where I found my voice as a writer and scholar and my confidence as a teacher. And just to add a little uh, note about my time teaching at A&T. Um, back then the English department in the early 2000s was really old school. At the time, their idea of new faculty orientation was to say, this is the text, there's your classroom, now go make it work. And that was both a frightening and exhilarating time for me. Frightening because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but exhilarating because I was finally, put, I was finally putting into practice all that I had learned and was learning about teaching young black students from my mentors like Drs. Patricia Bonner, Angela Ahmad, Michelle Levy, Eli Cooley, and others. I would take these lessons from a and to Texas A&M and later to Howard University and to where I am now at the University of Maryland at College Park. And while the faces and demographics of my students have changed from one campus to the next, the importance of centering voices of marginalized communities only increased for me in my role as a researcher and educator. It was during my time at A&T that I was also finding my way through and around the African-American literary canon. By this point, I had read many of the works of the major authors in the field, but I had also read nearly every Omar Tyree book, every Eric Jerome sister soldier novel there was. I was also reading a lot of street literature from the 1960s and 70s by people like Iceberg Slim and Donald Goins. And I was listening to recorded black arts poets like Mary Baraka, Gil Scott Heron and The Last Poets. My instincts were telling me that although we weren't really talking about these authors in the university classroom, of course, with the exception of Baraka, but these writers were certainly in deep dialogic with the African-American literary canon. I was drawing connections between what I was reading on my own and what we were discussing about Richard Wright and Toni Morrison, James Baldwin and Zora Neale Hurston and others. This was also a time when hip hop was becoming the most popular music genre in the country and beginning to gain traction as a music and commercial powerhouse around the world. And while there wasn't a clear definition for hip hop studies, many scholars had already begun making the connection between hip hop and the expansive cultural history of African Americans. Houston Baker, Trisha Rose, Mark Anthony Neal were already making noise. And Jeff Chang, Bakari Ketwana, and Imani Perry were, were just about to break through with their seminal texts. It was as good a time as any for emerging scholars interested in popular Black culture and looking for something new and exciting to write about. So with all, this, with all of this energy in the air, I decided to write my master's thesis, a comparative analysis of hip hop culture and the Black arts movement. This felt risky at the time because there wasn't much precedent and not too many folks in our department were writing thesis statements coming out of the program. But with the help of doctors Bonner, Levy, Ahmad, and Sam Garin, I wrote my project um, 
one of the first thesis projects in hip hop studies at North Carolina a and t and subsequently began my career as a hip hop scholar. So what is hip hop studies anyway? And what does a discourse about African-American literature that centers hip hop culture sound and look like? For starters, hip hop studies is a multidisciplinary field that encompasses nearly every major in the humanities and social sciences. And while there are very few universities that offer degrees or certificates in hip hop studies, nearly every university in the country offers a range of courses that focus on hip hop music and culture. Subsequently, any discourse in hip hop studies may look very different from one researcher or one university to the next. As a literary scholar, it is important to me that researchers in the field of hip hop studies make the distinction between rap as a literary form and hip hop as a cultural movement. On the one hand, rap is a form of poetry that actually predates hip hop culture. Rap is a literary subgenre sub in poetry that relies on the conventions of language. It conveys intense and expressive feelings and ideas using a distinctive language style and rhythm to express complex meaning. More importantly, rap draws from such historied and varied African American orator traditions, such as children's games like the jump rope and hand clap chant, Down, Down, Baby from competitive trickster toast and bad man ballads like Stack of Lee and Buffalo Bill, the call and response of black sermons, black church sermons, the singing of jazz musicians like Ella Fitzgerald, certainly the black arts movement poetry of writers like Amiri Baraka and Nikki Giovanni, but also a host of unknown black rhetoricians like the pimps and con men who are also working in a black vernacular idiom. Literary scholars working in hip hop studies cannot emphasize enough the dis, uh, rap's distinct literary and oratory sensibilities and, and influences. Hip hop, on the other hand, as we all know, is a cultural phenomenon that began in the early 1970s. It developed out of the social and artistic interactions of Black and Latinx New, York, New Yorkers. The first examples of hip hop culture, the dance, visual arts, fashion, music, come from the mostly poor and working class people of color who populated New York City's most destitute boroughs. Hip hop music, which combines all the sonic visual aspects of this expressive artistic culture, originated from a combination of traditional African, African-American and African diasporic music forms, including blues, jazz, gospel, reggae, samba, mamba, and even the harmonic rhythmic features from Western and Sub-Sahara Africa. Hip hop as we know it today began in 1973 when Jamaican born musician Clive DJ Cool Herc Campbell created an innovative DJing technique using two turntables on which he manipulated two identical records simultaneously, stretching a song's drum and percussion solos, inventing what would later be known as the breakbeat. Although there are conflicting dates as to exactly when hip hop first appears on the public stage, the accepted consensus is that the official birthplace of hip hop is in the 102 unit apartment building at 1520 Sedgwick Ave in the Bronx community where uh, DJ Hurt lived. It was in the building's community center, uh, community room that DJ Hurt popularized the breakbeat which gave way to the pop locking and dancing and the acrobatic dance styles that virtually mimicked the hard hitting sounds of the drum break. By the mid 1970s, the seminal, uh, the seminal turntable is coming out of the Bronx where Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambata, and of course, DJ Cool Hurt. Rap, however, as an artistic form first began as commentary on the DJ's musical skills their capacity to move seamlessly between breakbeats, the quality and exclusivity of their music choices, all of that, and um, all, uh, um, excuse me, let me back up. The exclusivity of their music choices and most importantly, their ability to keep the party going. During these hip hop parties and performances, rappers introduce DJs in their songs, but often recognize their own artistic abilities as writers and lyricists. At the time, the MC's role was very similar to popular African-American urban radio disc jockeys like Anthony DJ Holloway, Eddie Chiba, and Robert Wolf Wolfman Jack Smith. 
according to many of these rappers of the golden era who got their start in the early and mid 80s black radio disc jockeys were some of the first rap that they um some of the first rap to use the hip-hop style creating live performances that included singing and rhyming and call and response and they interacted with their audiences the oral innovation caught on with rappers and in turn their lyrical prowess gained the attention of many hip-hop fans the mc's rhymes were composed in such a way to take full advantage of the of the of the breaks between the songs Eventually, their commentaries move from voicing the musicality of the DJs to an expression of their own artistic abilities and life experiences. Consequently, the role of the MC in performance grew steadily, and soon they became the most visible members of the hip hop community, not unlike the visibility of poets in both the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement. For me, this is where a discourse on African American literature that centers hip hop begins at the point of the rap poet's pen. As a literary discourse, rap might also be analyzed as part of a literary subgenre in African American literature. When I began work on my dissertation at Texas A&M in 2010, I started to bring into my research of African American literature a little discussed subgenre of black writing called street lit. Street lit narratives, proto street lit narratives can be located as far back as the 19th century when European and American authors began to chronicle the social impacts of the Industrial Revolution on the masses. Many of the themes and literary styles associated with street literature today were established during this time. Two of Emily Zola's work, El Asmor and Nana, for instance, helped to establish realism and naturalism as the dominant literary concept in street literature. The popularity of sociological studies, such as the Reverend Thomas DeWitt Talmadge's The Night Side of City Life and Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives, demonstrated how depictions of individuals battling addiction and poverty appealed to Americans' growing fascination with and fear of slum life in the country's earliest urban tenements. Stephen Crane's 1893 novella, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, which is recognized as one of the earliest examples of street literature, is the first significant example of literary determinism in American literature. Crane's inscription in several copies of the novel read in part, quote, it tries to show that environment is a tremendous thing in the world and frequently shapes lives regardless. If one proves that theory, one makes room in heaven for all sorts of souls, notably an occasional street girl who are not, confi who are not confidently expected to be there by many excellent people. Put in the hip hop vernacular, Crane is simply asking, is there a heaven for a gangster? The earliest contributions of street literature by African American authors is perhaps The Sport of the Gods by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Dunbar's turn of the century novel vividly chronicles the northward migration of, of benighted African Americans out of the Jim Crow South and into the supposedly free and egalitarian North where instead they were met with not just the hostility of Northern urban living condition, conditions, but with, but with de facto segregation as well. The Great Migration would begin in the 1910s, bringing scores of African Americans from the American South to the Northern slums. Over the following six decades, fully six million Black folks would come North, replacing European ethnics who steadily assimilated into America's white majority and left the cities for surrounding suburbs. As American cities became blacker, so did the literature of its cities. More broadly, communities like Harlem and New York City in the 1920s and 30s were, were becoming the intellectual, cultural, and artistic epicenter of black life. They also gave texture to the massive conceptual shifts in writing about Black urban spaces and at the end of the Great Depression's first wave. And at this time in the 1920s, unlike Dunbar's pessimistic views of urban cities, for instance, in which the author describes the industrial North as a wicked and evil in comparison to Southern agrarian culture, which despite its poverty and the persistence of racial terror is depicted as the seat of religious piety, 
Novels like Home to Harlem were about Black city life during the party years of the Harlem Renaissance. In McKay's version, Harlem was decidedly Black, was a decidedly Black urban space which boomed with the excitement of dancing and gambling and drinking and prostitution. Unlike Dunbar, McKay's, McKay presents the urban city with the unjudgmental voice of an Harlemite longing for home. For home. Then there's the noir crime writing genre that many white writers like Dashiell Hammond and Raymond Chandler popularized in the 1920s and 30s. These novels will become the medium for Chester Hines. Hines, who had ironically moved to Europe in the years after World War II, gave up the writing of social protest literature to write detective novels that would inspire the black exploitation films, uh, film genre two decades later. Himes based most of these detective novels in Harlem, A Rage in Harlem, Cotton Comes to Harlem, For the Love of Emma Bell, and the rest were, would all take Harlem as their fictive home. Himes successfully invested the noir genre with the particularities of the Black street experience. With time, street lit had come to seem almost an exclusive subgenre of African American literature itself, which is quite an achievement for a class of writing that major touchstones have been written by writers who, have, who come from, who come to the genre rather, from the despised quarters of American experiences like the prisons and the ghettos and even the activist circles. In the 1960s, as the Black arts movement re refigured Black arts, not as the adjuncts of canonized white writers, musicians, painters, sculptors, and dancers, but rather as the keepers and developers of their own canon fully equal with any other. Writers of even the lowest, most marginalized Black social classes were finally given a voice. Gangsters, pimps, ex-cons, drug addicts now told their stories in raw and uncut. Donald Goins, Iceberg Slim all pen what will become iconic hardcore tales of America's ghetto streets and prisons. At the same time as these street narrativists were achieving critical mass, Malcolm X posthumously published autobiography, made the rounds on college campuses and in prison cells across the country. Malcolm's story of orphanhood, drug addiction, gangsterism, prison and religion, political and psychic redemption would show, the, would show just what brilliance the best of America's have-nots, the incarcerated, the neglected, the broken, what they all contain. The book, the book would become in its narrative arc from Malcolm's criminal exploits and incarceration to his successive redemption, religious and political, the template for the reformed gangster turned enlightened spokesperson. Rappers from Rakim to Ice Cube to Nas and Tupac and Kendrick Lamar would use the rough coordinates of this archetypal story to tell their own stories through rap and hip hop music. It's also important to note that the second wave of African-American street lit subgenre in the 1990s arose in direct relation to the rise of its musical equivalent, hip hop. Linked to hip hop by its unstincting focus on the lives of socially marginalized Black people living in American inner cities, the subgenre is inseparable from hip hop. Like many independent or underground rap artists, urban fiction novelists that emerged in the early and mid 90s were African American writers who didn't seek validation from the traditional mainstream publishing industry, nor the network of MFA programs across America. Instead, an audience for urban fiction emerged in the 1990s from a primarily urban African-American readership. Sister Soldier, Terry Woods, Vicki Stringer, all are among the African-American writers who came to prominence in the 90s and early 2000s. Furthermore, urban fiction located, urban fiction's location as a black urban readership location of a black urban readership in the 1990s can be seen as a piece of the sea change wrought by hip hop. Like hip hop, urban fiction centered the black urban experience while allowing often disenfranchised black urbanites to monetize their culture to a greater degree than ever before. As hip hop became a global billion dollar industry in the 90s, 
urban fiction became increasingly popular. And while the height of its popularity passed in the decades of the 2000s, urban, fiction continued, urban fiction's continued presence in the literary landscape is a testament to the necessity of the narrative's characteristics to the subgenre. Just as important as genre analysis is to any hip hop centered discussion of African American literature is also the examination of one of black writing's major literary tropes, the black bad man. The bad man as an American cultural phenomena dates as far back as the 19th century with iconic outlaws like Wild Bill Hickok, Billy the Kid and Jesse James. The traditional bad man is someone who lacks conventional heroic qualities and attributes such as idealism, morality, courage. Although bad men may sometimes perform actions that are mor morally heroic, it is not always for the right reasons. They often act primarily out of self-interest or in ways that defy conventional ethic codes. For more than a century, African-American poets and singers have performed, modified, reinvented, and, re and reimagined the traditional bad man figure. The African-American version of the bad man, sometimes called a bad nigger, is one of the most distinctive, one of the most distinctly American cultural phenomena there is. Unlike the traditional bad man, the African-American bad man is a dubious figure who is both very real, but also imagined osculating between diverging extremes within our, within our national consciousness. For instance, today, the trope of the black bad man continues to provoke opposing reactions and interpretations of political protests, especially in response to the hostile forces that bear down upon black people. Contemporarily, these differences account for the competing ways in which we respond to racial tra tragedy such as kneeling for our national anthem or rioting and protest to the, killing of, to the killing of unarmed black people by white police officers. On the one hand, many people, especially those in communities of color, see both forms of protest as legitimate, particularly, particularly when measured against the hypocrisy and brutality of white supremacist terrorism. On the other hand, there are many Americans who, despite a history of racial terror in the US, describe any oppositional behavior among black people as simply bad. While the bad black man first appears as a central character in African-American literary art during the orator period of the middle to late 19th century, his latest incarnation, of course, is in contemporary rap, specifically gangster rap, which first appears a hundred years later. More interesting, however, is that the contemporary bad man figure is only slightly changed from his original African-American folk origins. Much like the originators of the black bad man, gangster rap artists conjure the historic figure of the bad man to either vaunt their lyrical prowess, ridicule their competitors, recount their sexual escapades, or threaten their adversaries with, vi with, with violence and sometimes death. Through contemporary boast, gangster rap has given the bad man figure a vast and completely unprecedented notoriety. In the last decade and a half, young black rap performers from all over the country have modified the traditional bad man of violence into a more commercial and palatable form of counterculture, counter, countercultural black male behavior. And to the surprise of many, these young gangsters have acquired huge audiences, especially young eager young white men and boys who have been buying their records, making them rich and propelling them out of anonymity and into the celebrity ranks of pop stars. To a pounding beat that rattles the senses, gangster rap takes on a grimly realistic journey through the devastated neighborhoods that they celebrate as home, yet complain about because of the years of racial prejudice and developmental neglect. And as the tone of rap changes to trap music today, and becomes more blunt and more profane, it continues to solidify its dominance and characteristics as the voice of the bad man. So in closing, I believe my approach of, uh, of placing hip hop at the center of, of my discourse on African-American literary tradition adds to the histories of African and African diasporic cultural and literary movements. Indeed, hip hop culture is an important part of any discussion of African-American literature. 
as a literary and cultural history of popular black fiction and poetry, rap can expand the fields of African-American literary and cultural studies. At another level, however, I understand that, re that, that this research challenges the hegemony of both Western and African-American literary canon. Rap decenters conventional notions of literary merit and aesthetic value. And even though this issue of merit and value will likely remain unresolved tonight, it is my hope that this talk provides a useful starting point for young scholars to reconcile, understand, and appreciate what I consider to be the most con consequential, if not sig significant form of black writing in our time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Winston. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I am not able to turn my camera on. Our moderator asked me to do so, but, but I am unable to do that. At this point in time, for all of our attendees, if you have any questions for Dr. Winston, um, wow, <laughs> I'm still, I was still taking notes. <laughs> you my head couldn't keep up with you. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'm so intrigued. I'm so intrigued by this. I really am. Um, for any of our attendees, if you would, I ask that you place your questions in the Q&A or um, either the, the chat. I, we would prefer the Q&A, but not everyone. Is, is, they don't um, necessarily deviate to the chat, excuse me, to the Q&A. Nonetheless, I do see one particular comment already from one of our attendees, Anjan Basu. He says, not so much a question, but Dr. Winston, well done, sir. <laughs> Anjan is another one. He's another one part of that rigorous <laughs> group of ours. Um, and I can't turn my camera on either. So I, I, I'm sorry for um, not having it on and you can see my... <laughs> That's okay. We, we've dealt with various challenges this evening, but nonetheless, we're Aggies and as Dr. Um, Harper said earlier, Aggies do, and we are persevering. Okay, I do see one question in the Q&A, Dennis, and that is, thank you so much for an incredible talk. I'm curious if street lit slash urban fiction in the 90s serves as hip, -hop, hip hop's literary equivalent. In what ways do hip hop's non-written signifying elements, i.e. sound, sampling, performance, persona, et cetera, manifest in the literature? That's a great question. Um, I think the answer quite simply is that these authors place the music in the literature. If you read Street Lit, even um, you know, Iceberg Slim, he's mm -hmm. bringing in Billie Holiday, he's mm -hmm. bringing in all of the jazz greats. So in a sense, you're so, especially if you're familiar with the music and you know how it is to read a novel. I mean, once you get deep into a novel, you have all of, it's like a movie playing in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as these authors sort of bring in, um, you know, these references to music, whether it's someone sitting in a car or an Iceberg Slim's case, listening to a record in one of his, his um, hotels, it, 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 it seeps into the imagination. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's how, how I would explain that. Okay, all right. Thank you. If there's a follow-up question for him, if there's something you'd like him to elaborate on, please again, add that to the Q&A. Okay, Dennis, the next question comes from Crystal and she asks, do you have any advice on how to analyze song slash music videos um, in class? We do this already in our classes, but I'd like some of your expert advice in this area. Well, I, I, well, I, I would say, um, you know, I approach it the same way that I, I approach poetry, which is to simply explicate it. Um, okay. You know, one of the things that I've found with my students is that while they certainly come to class with a wealth of knowledge about hip hop music, they are often, you know, I often have to remind them about certain sort of historical points. So for example, I remember when Nicki Minaj's Bees in the Trap um, song came out in the video to me, was really remarkable because I noticed that in that video, no one was touching the women in the video, which was really different from hip hop videos up until that point. Mm. And um, what I was talking to my students about was the history of hip hop videos and why, you know, Bees in the Trap as a video 
was so significant mm -hmm. really in relationship to that history. So, you know, one of the, my advice would be certainly to explicate the, the, the songs as you would a poem, but also um, I, I think it's really critical to, to bring in that historical um, sort of reading so that we can, can kind of situate it so students understand you know, you know, is Nicki Minaj in conversation with someone like, um, you know, um, Queen Latifah, or even in, in conversation with, with her her male counterparts in hip hop? Um, so that that's that's one of the things that I, I would suggest. Well, isn't it problematic though, as as far as conveying that type of message when it comes to performativity, the look but don't touch? That's still hegemonic, right? It is. I mean, I think the reality is that. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about hip hop, and even if we think about the hip hop novel, mm -hmm. um, and, and how, you know, the hip hop novel was dominated by, by women writers. I mean, of course, we have the Omar Tyrese and the Eric Jerome Dickies, but, you know, that says nothing about, you know, the, the immense sort of popularity of the Sister Soldiers and, mm -hmm. and the Sapphires and the Black Artemis and, and even the readership. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that hip hop in many ways pushes black women out, or at least, you know, this is in the 90s when when gangster rap and the misogyny is is, is at an all time high. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I to some extent, yes, but I, I think in many ways, um, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of MCs are kind of working with with the kind of um, with the discourse with the with the the language with the images that are, are available to them. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, it's a matter of 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 pushing back against those, those images, those, that language. Um, so yeah, it, it certainly is problematic. Um, but at the same time, you know, Nicki Minaj is certainly um, working in a, 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 a field of men and, it, and is certainly trying to find her, her, her place. Mm. So um, another comment in the Q&A is from James and he says, thank you, Dr. Winston. And Crystal says, I hadn't considered that particular, that song in particular, thanks for that. So the fact that you specifically <laughs> um, named that particular Nicki Minaj video, she says that she's excited to take that one on. So you have quite a few fans that said, I'm a huge fan of your work. Awesome, Dr. Winston. So you're, you're getting quite a bit of kudos. So this is something Thank that, you <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> great job is another one that I'm, I'm reading as well. So um, one thing that I'm interested in, I, I would like your take on it, Dennis, and this is something that I have been exploring in, within my own hip hop discourse class. Why is it that the narrative or how women enter the space of hip hop now has been um, generalized in a sense that you must perform and be hypersexualized in order to, to, to see mainstream success and to see mainstream popularity and to be able to cross over into that mainstream realm. Why, why is that? Because when you mentioned the 90s in particular, as you were naming 90s artists, my mind went immediately to the female hip hop artists, those rappers, because they were the ones who had really big mainstream success and not all of them had to, you know, to jump ship and, and go in the other hypersexualized perspective. And if we're looking at it as a, a dichotomy. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I think it's interesting. I mean, it's, it, it has to do a lot with the culture and then the marketplace, right? In some ways, you know, um, black folks have control over the culture but they don't necessarily have total control over the marketplace and sometimes mm. the marketplace dictates um what is is um deemed successful and i think that that's partly sort of the answer to the question about Nicki minaj having to sort of straddle both of these kinds of of realities you know how do i get myself out there but also um stay true to who i am as an artist i think it's really difficult um, I, I don't know if I have the answer to that. You know, I think um, a lot of it comes down to consumers as well. I mean, we make choices in terms of who we want to listen to. I think that today hip, hip hop artists are in a better place than they've ever been before. Um, you can have an entire following and not be necessarily a mainstream artist. 
Mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of MCs who've prided themselves on being independent, being solely underground and having lucrative careers in that regard. Um, so I think it's a, it's a complex issue. I don't necessarily know um, what the answer to that is. Um, I think the reality, of course, is, is, is that, um, you know, these artists are, are operating in two spaces. I mean, it goes back to this whole issue of double consciousness. They're sort of operating as, 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 as individuals, but also as artists who, who um, are in the marketplace. Um, but how, how are you thinking about it? <laughs> I want to have a conversation. I, don't, I, I, don't, I want us all to sort of jump in. How do you, what do you guys think? Dr. Little, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm always a left-handed thinker. <laughs> so I just think about it in terms of also looking at how Black women through hip hop are now sort of taking back their own sexuality and finding empowerment within expressing their sexuality. Um, I mean, if we look at the history of African-American women mm -hmm. and trying to uphold this Victorian ideal of true womanhood, um, trying to um, get away from stereotypes and tropes of the mammy or Sapphire or um, uh, the Jezebel, trying to always get away from those sexualized or hypersexualized stereotypes has caused them to, in many ways, um, just sort of halt their own uh, expression of sexuality. And so mm -hmm. I kind of see, especially hip hop artists like um, Nicki Minaj and Cardi B and Megan mm -hmm. Thee Stallion, sort of finding mm -hmm. ways to enter a space and show that they have control, um, but they are sexual beings and they are proud of that. Um, and I think we can see that more clearly if we kind of listen to the lyrics right. that mm -hmm. these women are saying. The lyrics are very empowering. The lyrics are turning the tables, so to speak. And so, um, you know, it's not just that I'm a hoe. I'm a hoe if I want to be a hoe. And so what? You know, and so I think there is a moment of empowerment in um, these entertainers who want to show, um, you know, that as women, I am a sexual being and, I, being and I have control over that and I find empowerment within that. So that's just my take on it. Mm. No, I, okay. I, yeah, I think that's, I'd say it, it comes down to even respectability politics, right? They're mm -hmm. saying, I don't, I don't have to buy into you. That's what I was looking for, respectability yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have to buy into that. And, and to Joanna's point, I mean, honestly, Meg Thee Stallion is one of, one of my favorite new hip hop artists, primarily because she's so, she's so Southern in her rap. I mean, she reminds me of UGK. I mean, she's out of Houston, but mm -hmm. she, she does this sort of UGK um, eight ball MJG style so well. And I appreciate her for that. And if I were to think about who those artists were, MJ, MJG, 8-Ball, UGK, I mean, they were vulgar, they were provocative, mm -hmm. they were offensive. And Megan mm -hmm. Thee Stallion is saying, you know, why can't I be provocative and vulgar, just as vulgar as these men, and still demand respect? You know, and that was partly why I was so fascinated with Nicki Minaj's decision to have this video where no man is touching any woman in the entire video. And I think in terms of the sort of optics of that was really powerful. Mm. Okay, Dennis, there is another question for you. And well, first of all, I want to kind of give a bit of context. Can you tell us a little bit about your involvement with works, words, beats and life? And what can we expect from that in the coming future? Yes, so um, Words, Beats, and Life, the Global Journal of Hip Hop Culture is the journal um, um, arm of, of Words, Beats, and Life um, organization, which is a hip hop community outreach program in Washington, DC. They do remarkable work in the community. They do a lot of, of um, community cleanups and murals and, and, and all sorts of things. So if you happen to be in the Washington, DC area, certainly come check them out. Um, so, and I'm part of the organization um, on the journal side. And what we do with the journals, we, we invite a lot of young emerging um, scholars and, and artists in terms of poets and fiction writers and even visual art. Um, 
And we're also looking for, we, we've come up with this term called hip hop adjacent. And what that means for us is that, you know, the assumption is that if I'm going to submit something to a hip hop journal, it has to be really sort of hit you over the head um, with, with in terms of hip hop culture. But what we realize is that hip hop isn't so much um, a thing that we can point to as much as it's something that's within us. I mean, the way that we cook can be considered hip hop. The way that we, um, you know, think about landscapes and even architecture in some ways can be um, can be tied to hip hop culture, especially if you think about, you know, the spaces in which hip hop emerges. So, you know, we're looking for folks who have really interesting ways of thinking about hip hop that aren't necessarily, um, you know, readily identifiable as as hip hop culture. Um, so that that's some of the things that we're looking looking at or looking for. Um, in terms of what's coming out next, um, we're in the process of working on our next special issue, um, or rather that special issue is coming out soon. It's um, an issue on hip hop in South Africa. Um, we hope that uh, will be one of an ongoing series of, of, of issues that focus on hip hop music on the continent. Um, we just finished an issue on street literature, um, which was um, guest edited by um, my friend and colleague, uh, Keenan Norris at San Jose State University. And also let me give a shout out to um, the guest editors for the um, South Africa issue, Dr. Masia Clark at Howard University and Jen Fett. Um, they both have done some remarkable work um, on that issue. And I guess I should shout out the staff as well. Um, Alice Sandojaraj um, out of Georgetown, Alan King, um, Mikkel Lee, um, and of course our brilliant managing editor, Anastasia Clouting. Um, so that's what we're doing with the journal. Um, and we're also, we also solicit um, um, calls for special issues. So if you are interested in devoting an entire issue to um, a concept as it relates to hip hop, mm -hmm. um, we're open to uh, reading those proposals as well. Okay, all right, wonderful, wonderful. And can I can I say a little something about the hip hop is lit I, as well? You you go you you've got the mic, brother. You just go right ahead. <laughs> well, so 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 hip hop is lit, um, and it literally it, you know it. it it, it sort of came out the title uh, when the term lit was more popular. Um, and that's the thing about hip hop slang. It's like, you know, you got to use it quick. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the idea is that, it, you know, of course it's a play on hip hop literature. Um, and what we're working on now is a mixtape for our street lit um, project that, that we just, um, we finished up. And one of the things that we're doing is we're getting um, folks involved in terms of reading different passages from street literature and reimagining them as hip hop verses. Mm. Um, so that's that's some of the things that we're working on in terms of, of that project. Okay, all right. And if it, more information wanted to be found out about that, as far as um, hip hop is lit, what, where would we go? Is that tied into also words, beats, and life or? Yeah, that's that's tied into all uh, all into words, beats, and okay. life. Um, okay. The organization. So, is that something we could Google words, beats, and life as far as the organization and find that information? Yeah, I know that we are in the process of rebuilding the um, journal wing of the website. Um, mm -hmm. Let me pull that up and put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, there is a comment in the Q&A section, which indicates that a resource for all of us is the Furious Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University. That's right. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Jessia actually says hip hop is poetry and vice versa. Um, I, I wasn't going to put you on the spot, but I'm considering doing this, but I'm going to give you time to reflect on it. You, are you working on any new, new work, <laughs> Dennis? I am. I am. Uh, uh, um, thank you. Hold on, I'm putting this. Yes. And so for all of the panelists, Dr. Winston has added that link in the chat so that you all can copy and paste it in your ver own various browsers. Yeah, that would take um, you um, to Words, Beats, and Life's okay. um, sort of home page. Okay. And, and you can see all of what goes on um, with them. So. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a new um, a chapter uh, coming out 
Um, it's called A History of African American Orature, The Bad Man Hero and Gangster Rap. Mm. And that should be appearing, it will be appearing. Um, it's in the um, final stages of editing. Okay. Um, it will be appearing in the uh, Companion to African Rhetoric. And that's through, mm. I believe, Lexington Books, um, edited mm. by um, my colleague, Sagun um, Ige uh, at Howard University. I believe he's still okay. at Howard University. Um, so I'm working on that. And I'm also um, in the process of, of um, putting together our, our um, proposal for a handbook on street literature. Okay. Um, so we're still really in the early stages of that. Um, so there isn't really much I can, you know, share. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where you, you, um, you know, you don't want to put the cart before the horse, but yeah. um, certainly be on the lookout for that. And essentially what we're looking for, um, and that, that's a project that I'm working on with, with my uh, colleague, Keenan Norris. Mm. Um, and this is just really going to be uh, going to be an edited volume of critical essays and interviews. And hopefully it'll serve as a kind of repository of, of street lit um, of the best of, of street literature's history and scholarship. Um, and that's where we're really trying to get to a point where, you know, we can sort of bring in texts that folks haven't traditionally thought of as, as street literature. So for example, um, you know, we've, we've, Keenan and I have talked about how, you know, the slave narrative as an example of a sort of um, template for, for street lit in terms of, of the, um, you know, existing in two worlds or writing oneself, um, you know, uh, or, or the pursuit of freedom. Um, and certainly the, the, um, the autobiographical element of, of the slave narrative. And I, I, we talked about this, Hope, you told me, mm -hmm. or you reminded me rather that, um, you know, Toni Morrison said that all things begin with the uh, slave narrative. So the slave narrative, yes. Sir. Right, so we're certainly taking, taking that um, to heart. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, just the ongoing work with um, with words, beats, and life. Okay, thank you. Michael asks in the Q and A. Great talk, Dr. Winston. Thank you. I just taught Baldwin Sonny's Blues this morning in my American Lit class. So I'm thinking about this intertextuality between literature and music. Mm -hmm. he, he continues and says, "I'm particularly interested in how this dir for creative endeavor." be it music or literature can attest to or express personal suffering while also providing a method to triumph over suffering and connect with others simultaneously. He's wondering, what are your thoughts on that either as in Baldwin or, or, or any artists of today? Well, Hope, you and we talked about this, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we certainly talked about this. Um, you know, I, so, so, you know, one, one of the, um, you know, um, the things that I, I often write about, and this comes um, out of um, Abdul Jam Muhammad's um, text, The Deathbound Subject, when he's talking about Richard Wright. And as I was reading that, it, it seems so profound, right? Richard Wright, or in, in the text, um, he talks about how there are both the sort of Jim Crow circuits of death and familial circuits of death, meaning that there is this mm -hmm. threat of death that happens, of course, you know, when we leave our homes, right? When we go mm -hmm. out into the world, you know, it's, it, it, there are, are, are far too many examples of how black folks and, and, and people of color, when we leave the house, um, there is that perpetual threat of death. But there's also this sort of weird perpetual, there, there's this threat of, 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 of death at home, you know, like don't do that or you'll go to jail, right? Mm -hmm. Don't touch that in the grocery store. And I was thinking of, of Kendrick Lamar and his, his album, um, Damn, mm -hmm. and the track Fear. And in the track he had in the very beginning, it's, um, I believe it's, it, it's him sort of um, illustrating his mom and, and saying, boy, if you don't do this, I'm gonna beat you and, and, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this idea of mental health and hip hop music is, is very mm -hmm. real. I think MCs are certainly have been talking about it for so long, I think that you know, they more recently are more forthright in talking about, you know, where this pain is coming from. I mean, you have someone like G Herbo and his album PTSD, you have, mm -hmm. um, you know, the recent, you know, passing of DMX has really shined a light on, on his work and us looking back at his work and thinking about how much pain and trauma he revealed in his work over the years. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's certainly, certainly there, but again, hope, I mean, you know, this is work that, that you do more, more, um, um, 
um, more than I in, in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm laughing at you. I'm laughing at you, Dennis. I am laughing at you. This is okay. Like <laughs> well, that, Robert, that, that, that's just my answer. I mean, it, it, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Um, Robert asks, will there be an issue on Lil Nas X laugh out loud? You know what's funny, Robert, is that I was I was going I was going to DM you <laughs> about that in particular, right? Um, and so I think you and I are on the same page. Um, I, I would I would love to have that issue. Words, Beats, and Life um, had an issue on sex and sexuality, and that was some years ago. So um, I think it's high time that we we revisit revisit that issue. And even going back and, and looking at some of, um, um, you know, revisiting some of those contributions and seeing if even the contributors are, are interested in, in rethinking or, or, or addressing um, some of the things that came up, you know, those those many years ago. I mean, everything in hip hop is at warp speed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that, you know, we were talking about Nicki Minaj and, and when she came out, just even her name, Nicki Minaj, was just this, this tidal wave in hip hop music. And if we were to think about where we are now versus then, I mean, the, the notion of, of sex and sexuality in hip hop music is so different and vast than it than it than it's ever been. Um, so yeah, to that that question, I, we absolutely are. I, I I would love to do an issue. I think what Joanna said a little, what, what Joanna said earlier in reference to um, sexuality and the the black female tropes very much speaks to this notion of respectability politics, which also could speak to, you know, a sexuality issue as well. So I think there are a variety of ways that that could be explored. Right, and, and, and of course, you know, Lil Nas X's Monte, um, Montero, I believe is the name of the, the song completely just song. shatters yeah. it all, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Little, did you have any questions? I can't think of any questions at the moment. I'm just soaking it all in. I know. I know this has been amazing. Just a comment. Thank you so much. You have really, you reinvigorated me. I'm like writing. Just I'm, I'm just really, really honored to to share this space with you and to hear um, your scholarship and the great things that you are doing. And I just appreciate you sharing with us. Thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm just honored. Um, you know, to, to have been invited and, you know, to share, to share what I'm, I'm doing and, um, you know, to hear all the wonderful things you all have to say about, about hip hop music and culture and, and its connection to African American literature. So this is a, a, a pleasure and a joy for me as well. Oh, thank you, Dennis. <laughs> feels like old times. It feels like, it feels like, know. like <laughs> Okay, now we'll be here until nine o'clock at night if we can. Oh gosh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the old days, talking for hours. Oh listen, man. Listen, even 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 uh, 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 Robert popped in the chat. If Patrice Bernard is out there and she pops in the chat, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> oh, those were some good times. Those were some good times. I didn't know what an intellectual conversation was until I started listening to y'all and sometimes <laughs> participating in those conversations. I said, oh, like we're really doing it. It was, it was so, it was so fun. Yeah, I, I don't fun. think, I don't think we, I don't think we thought of it in that way either. I yeah. think, you know, I, I remember um, even, even really before graduate school, we would all sort of, you know, crowd together in, in, in Crosby and, and, and um, you know, talk on one of those benches by the windows. And mm. like, that's just how it, how it went. And, you know, and honestly, it wasn't until I left a &T where I realized, oh, we were, this is what we've been doing this whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually really do miss the way in which, you know, we, we made what, what was ultimately intellectual conversation. Um, we just made it, you know, us just folks talking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. That was certainly a unique space. It really was. It was, it was so special. It was so special. So, okay, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, do you want to make any closing remarks for us, Dennis? 
Is there anything uh, we should be reading? Anything we should be paying attention to? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I was thinking about that and I'm, I'm giving this person a shout out, hopefully um, as an opportunity to work with them at some point. Uh, Regina Bradley, um, mm. her, her um, chronicling mm -hmm. Stankonia recently uh, mm -hmm. came out and I believe that may be the first bit of scholarship on, on Outcast, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I know that there's work on hip hop in the South, um, but this may be the first sort of piece on, on Outcast. And again, this is just really a testament to um, the need for more scholarship in hip hop studies because, you know, we're talking about Outcast and that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but, but you know, hip hop in Atlanta has completely changed um, mm -hmm. since Outcast was at, at, the, at the top of their career. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would certainly encourage you all uh, to read that. Um, in terms of, of, of street lit text, um, you know, um, MK Asante's book, uh, shout out to um, uh, Patricia Elam for putting me on to, to um, um, MK Asante, uh, D. Watkins, The Cook Up, I'm sure you all um, are familiar with, with, with his work, I'm out of Baltimore. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, you know, and, and, and I was just talking to my good friend, uh, Demetrius Noble, uh, about mm. uh, Griselda. Uh, so in mm. terms of who we're listening to, um, I, I am listening to all things Griselda. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm also, you know, really deep into my um, Wu-Tang bag after uh, <laughs> the Raekwon ghost faced battle. I, I've gone back to a lot of Raekwon's work um, especially in light of of the group Griselda, um, so that that's that's ultimately where I am. Okay. Oh, and then I, I also have to give a shout out to um, again my my good friend and colleague Keenan Norris's mm -hmm. novel uh, Brother Dancer. Okay, you know I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to write as fast as I can. All right. Um, well, thank you with that. So at this point in time in our program, you have another comment that says, thank you, Dr. Winston. Thank you for your scholarship. Oh, that's, you, you, you've got a lot of kudos. Dr. Ahmad. You've got, you got a lot of kudos. Um, I want to thank everyone for their patience with an, oh, wait, wait, we might have another one. Okay, it's a suggestion in, um, from Jessia to add Kanwani Fidel to the list, also out of Baltimore. If there are no other comments or questions, then I will take the time now to, I, I want to share in so much my um, sincere, sincere heartfelt warm thanks to Dr. Winston for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come to and speak to us and to those who are a part of the program, who are joining the program, who are alum of the program, um, for those that I don't know, Dennis, if you realize, but you have, there are some new students who are, well, there are incoming students for this fall that have, we sent them the invitation to join us this evening, and there are several that have appeared here. So I, I would not be surprised if they reached out to me later on and said, may I have his contact information, <laughs> or they may just look you up themselves. So I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. But I cannot yes, thank you enough. Enough. I can't thank you enough on behalf of the English department and the graduate program in the English department. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us because we know how valuable it is in this particular state that we're in. And at this time, I'm going to um, go ahead and close the program out. Thank you so much for your participation with our inaugural um, alumni, elect alumni lecture series on behalf of the Department of English and there will be others, so please keep note of our social media accounts. And hopefully Dr. Winston will be participating with us again. We do anticipate um, in the near future hosting some book talks as well, Dennis. So once that, that book comes out, I would like to <laughs> just get an early invitation, ask you to come back and hopefully face-to-face -face speak and to share with us how that turned out, the fruition of that. That's the motivation I need. Thank you. Yes, yes. That's <laughs> and, what we're talking about. And yes, yes to face to face. Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I I need face to face. Um this yes. is so this is
It's so very difficult. <laughs> this is so difficult. Um, but thank you so much for everyone for taking the time out of your schedule to join us this evening. And again, kudos, humble regards to Dr. Winston. Thank you so much, Dr. Little, for agreeing to introduce him. I knew you would be able to do so in a My way that pleasure. no one else, no one else would be able to. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and finally, thank you so much to Dr. Kimberly Harper for being our moderator and for setting yes. this up this evening. Yes. Despite the trials and tribulations that we dealt with, she remained. She remained yes. and she was determined to get it resolved and she got it resolved. So thank you. And and um, Dr. DiPolo says, thank you as well, Dr. Winston. He, he, and he, he stayed the entire time. So <laughs> he wanted to hear you from beginning to end. So again, kudos to you. But at this point in time, um, Dr. Harper is going to end our session. This will be rec this was recorded. And so as a result, for those who might want to go back and to listen to it again, Dr. Harper will be posting this on our social media accounts. And so that way you'll have you'll have access to either to listen to it or to, to watch the video. But thank you so much for your time this evening. You all have a good evening. Continue thank to be you. well, healthy and be safe. Bye bye. Thank you so bye -bye, much. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye.